Hello and welcome to Springboard, a virtual university. My name is Albert Okran, welcoming you on behalf of Team Springboard, led by Comfort. This is your most inspirational show and the point where the greatest minds in the world converge. Your virtual university is brought to you by the Springboard Roadshow Foundation in partnership with the Multimedia Group and proudly sponsored by MTN Pulse, UMB Bank, the Enterprise Group, with support from the graphic business. You've had an amazing journey traveling in the engine room, and many of you keep calling us and telling us how much fun it was getting into the piston rings of the lives of frontliners in various fields. Make time to check out the various episodes of the engine room in or on my, my YouTube page, Albert Okran, and learn the key lessons that have emerged from the various people that we have interacted with. Today, we have a very special conversation about emerging trends in business with a focus on banking. And it's my joy to welcome the recently appointed Executive Director of Business at UMB Bank, Ni Amankra Tete, into the studios for a conversation about emerging trends with a focus on banking. Ni, good to see you. Great to see you, Reverend. <laughs> How has the last couple of months been? Absolutely exciting and <laughs> dreamy. Are, are, you, are you a car person? <laughs> Not much. <laughs> Not much. My wife, is a, my wife is such a car person. Oh, wow. I'm, I'm terrible. <laughs> I, I could, I could, you could put me in a different car and I wouldn't even know which, which one it is, but I would have asked you if you were to describe the last couple of months with a car engine, which, mm. which one would it be? Would it be a, an, a BM engine or, uh, or yes. an articulator engine? <laughs> I, I, I struggle. I think there's a cross somewhere there <laughs> where the articulator is running, but there's a, there's, a, there's a BM engine coming out there somewhere. So it's been, it's been, it's been very exciting. There's been quite a lot to do. Um, and the, the pitch has been quite high because there's a lot of excitement about change. And it, it looks like uh, you know, the people are very change ready. So you always have all of this energy in any room and in any meeting. So we'll be coming to talk about, about yourself, the bank, UMB Bank, the new role you are taking, and just the lessons for somebody trying to integrate into a new role. We have a number of listeners who are very keen to hear about what does it take to transition from one organization in a very different role to a new one in a different role? But let's start with you. So your person, where, where have you been and where have you come from? And that's a question that many people ask when a new executive is appointed. Oh, well, I, I've been, I've come from many places. I, I, I always think that I'm a product of incredible leadership, intended or not intended and amazing fellowship. I've, I think I've been that blessed. Um, and I've come from many places. Um, started out at Standard Chartered um, a little over 20 years ago um, as a trade operations uh, assistant. Um, learned on that job, moved into corporate banking. And there, there, there I met uh, uh, Mr. Alex Mould, <laughs> who, who uh, one fine day came by my desk and says, what do you think about working in corporate banking? I was like, who, me? <laughs> he says, yes, you. And that's how I made my move over there. Did some corporate banking, uh, relationship management, credit analyst. Mm -hmm. Then um, got on my, found my passion, which was largely in local business. So moved to Barclays Bank uh, about five years later um, and spent probably most of my working life there, 12 years at Barclays. Um, did so many things from... SMEs, then I found, I think, what was my big passion, <laughs> retail banking. Okay. Um, started out as a cluster manager, head of distribution, head of retail. Then did some time at our regional office um, as head of network optimization. Came back as retail and business banking director um, sometime in 2016. Um, and was there for about um, a year and a half before um, I was appointed MD at Bayport Savings and Loans. So I'm coming from Bayport Savings and Loans, and um, in each of these places, I, 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 I struggle to say there was a bad experience because I, I have come to understand that all of them um, somehow you know, do things in your DNA that allow you to be able to do the next job. 
So every time I come to a place where there's a, <laughs> it's a mountain or something impossible to do, I'm like, okay, uh, this means something's coming up there. And I, you know, I settle down and I just get through it. Um, it doesn't mean it's, oh, it's not painful. It's yeah, usually painful. But every single time I think I've been blessed with leaders have walked that journey before. So it makes, um, it makes calling on those strengths and those learnings very easy. But I've also been very supported by others who, who understood the moment. And I, 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 you know, I, faces just pass in front of me, as I remember, especially the followers who made those things that people now call successes easy to think about, but they were not easy. Let me let me just let me just pick on something that you just mentioned. You, 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 I like the way you capture it: great leadership and great followership. And and I think it's a very compelling um, description. But you talk about people whose faces come whenever you think about yes. your journey. Yes. Are there some faces that you still remember even Absolutely. today? Absolutely. Give me an idea. Um, so when I think about great followers, I remember people like Peter Forjo, who was always calm and collected and analytical. <laughs> I remember Farian who was, you know, all over the place. He could just move a crowd with his charisma. Um, I remember Charles, Ch Charles, you know what time it is, was what he always said. <laughs> He's a fun, fun, loving leader. Um, I remember um, a lady um, in a teller enclosure. We did a Day in Your Shoes uh, program one day, and I spent, I think, about four hours in a teller enclosure my respect to every single teller in all of Ghana. She taught me some very vital lessons in patience and, and learning how to deal with routine. Um, I remember um, Bridget Sarkodie and a, a number of people who, whose interaction with myself just made life a lot easier there. Jeff Soa, uh, so many names. Um, so many people. You know what you've done with this very brief description that you just gave? Many people are, many people talk about mentors in their lives, big, larger than life figures who made an input into their lives. And it's normal to hear somebody say, oh, Alex Mould invested in me, this person, this MD invested in me. But when you mention followers, people who served, as it were, under you, but who made an impression on you, and you mention them by name, yeah. And particularly the person who took you into the teller enclosure for four hours and you learnt about patience and routine, it, it must be very nice for them listening to you, watching you at home to see, oh, he remembers. Are you, are, uh, do you have a very good memory? Well, my wife would not share that view. <laughs> <laughs> Why is it? I think that people's, people have, people's wives have a different... <laughs> She wouldn't share that view, but um, there were just people who just stood out in the way they were. There was a lady, um, Margaret Abebrese, when I ran into her, she had done something like 26, 27 years in the bank. And I said, but you're so amazing, you're brilliant. Why haven't you tried to do any new role? So she doesn't really know whether she's cut out for it. And I said, ah, you try it. I remember she went in for an interview where she became branch operations manager. And I remember when she retired after almost 30 years and she was celebrating, you know, and she called me and said, I saw back with you. I saw back with you. But it was, it, it, what, what Margaret had taught me was, you know, that calm optimism in spite of anything. And every time I look at her life, I'm, I'm, I'm totally amazed, you know. She had put 30 years of her life into one organization. Mm. And, you know, she had braved, I mean, almost every kind of change in 30 years of banking, for me, that was phenomenal. You talk about not seeing anything bad in any place you've been. Uh, and then you talk about the calm optimism that Margaret brought to bear. Are you by nature somebody who just looks at things and then sees the bright side of everything? Finally. <laughs> it didn't always start out like that. But I, um, I tend to be... Like when the heat is, is that's when I'm calmest. Mm. Um, and it's come out of many years of watching other people deal with challenges. Um, and I realized that panic just doesn't, actually when, when I'm um, like, you know, you know these near accident scenarios, uh, <laughs> my wife can see it coming from a mile and I've seen it, but she always looks at me and thinks, ah, you're not doing anything, <laughs> you know, but I'm 
probably calculate, okay, it's going to be like 15 meters before impact. Um, I don't want any confusion between. So all of these scenarios are playing. And I find out that you can actually, almost in slow motion, in your mind, see all these things unfold. And, and, and so for me, I, I value the importance of um, calmness, not panic in the, in the heat of situations. Yeah. Um, and and I, I value it. Not, I'm, I'm not always that calm. I usually have a blow up or so before the, <laughs> before the situation, but I actually have seen uh, great leaders bring that to bear and I've seen the outcomes. And I've also had the opportunity to be unsettled and panic and I've seen the outcome. And I've seen... I think you prayed the first two, one. <laughs> okay. the, the, the first one simply doesn't get today. And you may get... You, and a lot of people do things in panic and you actually get away with it. Um, but with hindsight, you realize that um, if you could just have had that second. second to pause and think it through, you probably would have gotten a lot more out of the experience than you did when you panicked. Proponents of management theory think that this is connected with emotional intelligence. I'll tell you what, I mean, I read one of Mandela's writings where he talks about being in a small plane and the plane threatening to crash because of the weather. And according to those who were reading the plane, the old man just kept relaxing and reading something he was reading. And they were literally almost like Jesus Christ. And they asking each other, don't you care that we are about to perish? And they said the old man was just cool. Cool, and then the plane finally, by some miracle, landed, and the woman said, "Wow, that was close. It was scary." And the guy said, "But you were just relaxed." He says, "You don't know what was going on inside." <laughs> Would you exploring the link between this calmness and emotional intelligence? Would you say that? To be a great leader and a great manager, you need to bring this skill to bear, especially in turbulent times. You know, a, a, a firm or a company gets their, their signals from the leadership. Mm. So obviously, if you're calm and, and focused on what needs to be done, your body language, your um, poise, your, just your posture will carry messages to your team and allow them to focus on what matters. Um, and if you're, if you're, if you're, if you're panicked or, you know, um, letting all of your emotions carry through to your team, you may lose one or two of them who could have been critical in bringing about a solution, but because of the state of their mind. So it, it, it's very helpful. However, I think there are so many forms of leadership that, you know, I've, I've worked under leaders who are extremely vocal and loud and, you know, go to the bully pulpit in, the, in that one, but they end up protecting everybody and uh, probably that works for them. But I have also seen where people have seized the opportunity to get their teams to understand that we are in this moment where if we could just pause for a moment and think through it, would actually be making history here. And when the entire team latches on that, the outcomes are so totally different. You, and the stories that come out and the learnings um, ground the firm. So for right. me, um, I, I absolutely um, I'm, I'm on a bench when it comes to um, just, you know, taking a deep breath, um, looking at all the things around you, remembering that you're leading people and that they, they're looking at you too, encouraging them, actually getting them to do their best work at that point in time not when it's rosy and easy. It, it, I, there's, there's, a, there's a lot to be said for that posture. I have, I have a thousand questions for you from what you just said, but there's something that is so strong on my mind, and I'd like to find out from you for the benefit of many of our listeners who are making a career transition, who have questions. You, uh, you transition from a role as managing director, CEO. You know, in Ghana, we like CEO, it's big. <laughs> It's big <laughs> to become executive director. It's a yes. very reputable bank you're serving in, and it's a beautiful role. Yeah. But, some, but somebody will still ask, <laughs> how does it feel to transition from being a chief executive mm. to being a, an executive mm. director? Mm. Talk mm. to us. Help us to understand <laughs> it. So that, that question came um, several times from almost every, right from the people who interviewed me to... Many other people have asked me that question, um, but um, 
The only person who never asked me that question was my wife. <laughs> Why? <laughs> she just, she, she, I think she just knows who I am. For me, it's more important about the... Who are you? No, let me explore the whole <laughs> If she knows who you are, who so, are you? So, so, um, I'm more interested in the impact I can make at any level of organization than what title I'm wearing. Um, and, it, it, uh, um, and, and I remember when I picked up the job um, as CEO for Bayport, um, the attraction was never the title. I was made a proposition about a challenge that was on hand and what they wanted to do. And that's what totally got to me, got me so excited. Um, and so typically every time I've made a move um, from one job to the next, the question I've always asked is, how much, how much impact can I make on this? Of course, the leader um, I'm working under now has led me before and given me space to grow. So I'm, I'm, I'm extremely comfortable <laughs> under his leadership. Um, I would not be losing anything as far as I'm concerned. So for me, those, those, those two things, um, 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 right? so f the first thing is, what's the opportunity there for me to learn, to grow? to be better, but most importantly, to make a real impact, an impact that matters. When I've, when I've ticked that box, the next one you're asking yourself is who's leading? Do I trust this person? Once I get to that point, I'm good to go. If you just joined us, this is Springboard, your virtual university, looking at emerging trends in banking, you see, what are you talking about? You are talking about a person who has taken up a role. But the beauty about this conversation is that we also get to unpack the life and career of Mia Mankrata, the recently appointed executive director of UMB Bank Ghana. We will first spend the first half of this conversation finding out about the person. In the second half, we will ask ourselves a big question, to bank or not to bank. You will find out why this question is so big. But me, in all this conversation, you you come across as somebody who, at the end of the day, measures your life by the results Absolutely. that you generate. That is my reading of your person. Would you say that from where you sit, at the end of the day, the, the, the main measure of your life is the results or the impact that you create? Would that be your philosophy of life? Not entirely. Give me an um, idea about your philosophy. When you say your wife is the one who knows you, I want to unpack <laughs> who are you. So help me to understand what is, what is the thrust of your focus as a person. So, so just by virtue of where I've had to work, results matter. Um, and results absolutely matter. If, if, you're, in, if you're, in, you're working in any corporate environment where there are investors, where there's outcomes expected, results matter. And by virtue of the rules I've had to play in all of these things, Results have always played a very important bit of it. And honestly, um, my, my family knew how very stuck on results I am at. But I've also learned that in, in seeking those results, I think the journeys we take to coming out of those results are probably the most important lessons that I am learning. So as a CEO of Bayport, um, when I came to work, what did I see myself come to do? I saw myself as someone who had been given stewardship of, over the lives of some 600 plus staff, whose families depended on what we did, whose well-being depended on what we did. And for me, how to affect each of them, in, and, and for me it's very important about the people who work with you or for you or in partnership with you, that the experience of how we collaborate or work on every single day matters. So every time I have an interaction with colleagues, for me, um, it's separate from the <laughs> results. And I'm, I'm hoping that I can connect with the person. It matters to me that you're going to have a connection that we can actually build on. So that when we come to the part where we are talking about how all of that matters for the business, you also have skin in the game. It's, 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 if, so... Um, and in every place I've been, it, it matters. It, it, I have seen how I've, I've, I've led where I've been autocratic and have had, a, you know, military barracks kind of thing. And we have won. And I've seen the success too that comes out from 
actually working with friends, colleagues who share common vision. And it's this and that. Right. So the, and for, that for comes those, for those who are reading, you can see that this and you that. You're seeing that the connection gets more results. We, absolutely. Right. When, when, people, when people can can read your heart, can, can, can say they know you, their, their attitude to how they work, their engagement with what they do, it's, it's totally different. It's, it's, it's a totally different ballgame. That's very interesting. Your use of the word connection reminds me of a recent interview I had with Janet Sunkwano, CEO of JNM Salon and Spa, yeah. and she used the word connection probably almost 50 times in one, <laughs> in a one hour interview. And I asked her what her favorite word was, and she could not trace, and I said the word is connection. <laughs> and she had to agree because, and to her, that it, it, was, it was connection yeah. networks. Yeah. Is, yeah. was the thrust of everything. You are saying that yeah. when people can connect to you as a leader with their hearts, they give everything yeah. for the work yeah. and do not even count it as work. Yeah. In your journey, have you failed before? Have you stumbled and fallen before and asked yourself, how did I get here? Absolutely. Help, <laughs> help our viewers to know, because when we interview an accomplished person, the question is always, the question always is, Charlie, it's good for you. It's good for you. Have you, no, 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 have no. you failed before? Have Absolutely. Have you cried um, before? Have you oh, been, you're back against the wall uh, before? Not many people have seen me cry before. <laughs> One or two people have seen me do that. But it's it, it, uh, failure. And, and, but you see, for me, the, the, the lesson I've learned about, so the very first, let me, let me give you a typical one. Um, very early in, um, when I, when I, started out, I wanted to do my master's. And so I signed up for a program, signed up for a long distance program and paid down almost 7,000 pounds. Today, my wife says, that's the biggest loss. <laughs> you have caught this family. You threw 7,000 pounds into a sink and flushed it away. And what happened? So I signed up for this course and I never completed it. Was it that the course wasn't available, or you didn't have time, or it was difficult? What happened? I told myself I didn't have time. And I say that I told myself I didn't have time. And it was my state of mind. I had been asked to step up on a roll because my boss had had to go away for a while. And I told myself, oh, this is so important. I don't have time to also do this. But then I, a few years later, I actually carried out a similar uh, program <laughs> whilst I was head of distribution, which was my most engaged job in my life to date. Right. And I did it. So immediately he told me that I was fooling a lot. <laughs> I didn't manage my time well. What course was that? Oh, it was an MBA program. It was a distance learning MBA program um, with Leicester. Um, and I actually got through all of the coursework, did all of that, and refused to sit down and pay attention to my dissertation. Um, I, I, and, 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 and it, it, it comes from something I know about myself, that um, for many, many people see me as this very laser focus, but I enjoy, I enjoy <laughs> a lot of rest. I enjoy my time alone. I'd read a good book any day that, you know, <laughs> do all this hard work and all of that. Right. So how do you unwind? Do you, do you play a sport? Do you, I read. Do you I, hang out on the weekends? How do you? How do you? Oh, how do you unwind? I, I read a lot. I I read. I, if I find a good book, I can be gone the whole weekend. But I also love. Um, I watch a lot of movies. I enjoy movies. I, I'm always looking out for something that totally I could not predict or see coming. What kind of what kind of movies do you watch? CSI. Do you watch, do you watch adventure action? I love <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I love all of that one, but it depends on what I'm trying to do. If I'm really trying to unwind, a good busha busha is fine. <laughs> but how do you spell busha busha? Jimmy something something. Then a good one. Like, but but I I love films that totally get me thinking. Wow, I didn't see that coming, or that's that's amazing. And you know you're, you're still thinking about it. Uh, many times over after the whole movie, um, that 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 just sets my mind going off in all the directions that typically doesn't go, and that's that for me. Unwinding is actually just moving out of what I'm usually doing uh, Monday, Friday, and sometimes weekends um, to doing something that is totally not me. Um, I love to travel. Uh, when I travel with the family, it's a lot of fun for me, um, and then I can f focus on being. Uh, with my kids, with my wife. I enjoy that very much. You're big on family? Extremely. 
it matters. Springboard your virtual university. Today is about emerging trends in banking and I'm having a time of my life having a conversation with Nia Mankratis, the newly appointed or recently appointed executive director of business at UAB Bank Ghana. We've spent this first part of the program getting into his life, his learnings, his love for family and some very interesting lessons are emerging. We'll take a break. When we come back from this break, we'll go into the banking hall and then climb through the banking hall, up the lift to the executive suite, or maybe not use the lift, use the staircase and stop at every floor so we can see what happens on each floor. Find out how difficult banking has become from the days we're using calories, and then learn about the future of banking and how we can all get on board and decide to bank or not to bank. Please don't go away. Don't be left out. Download the Pulse app from the App Store or Play Store to mash up all day, every day. You can also enjoy more mashup. Just buy the new Mega Bundle and get 3 gigabytes data, extra 400 megabytes for your social apps, and free MTN to MTN calls every Monday. So go ahead, feel the pulse on MTN Pulse. Just be we're good together everywhere you go. There once was a man who had it all. He had skill. He had charisma. He was loved by all. But above all, he knew the importance of helping others, lifting others up. He knew the importance of giving other people an advantage so that they too would use that advantage to help others. All you need is that advantage that sets you apart from the rest. And when you discover that advantage, life's challenges don't seem so daunting anymore. That's where we come in. Enterprise, your advantage. UMB was established in 1972 as the premier bank for the corporate and private sector in Ghana. From our very beginning, as the only Ghanaian bank serving all categories of businesses, we set a standard for excellence and innovation. Over the past 45 years, we've built a financially healthy and strong bank, demonstrated our commitment to our customers and to growing businesses, and exhibited originality and innovation at every turn. At UMB, our focus is built around people, service, products and technology. These are the key to our present success and our future triumphs. At UMB, we are poised to make a difference not only with our customers, but also in the banking industry. We invite you to share in our future. Our future starts now with you. Hi, this is Reverend Ikua. Springboard your virtual university. You need to keep watching this show because when you watch this, you get to make decisions based on information. So keep watching. Welcome back to Springboard your virtual university and to the Bushan Bushan edition. <laughs> As we hang out with Nia Mangratete, the executive director of business at UMB Bank Ghana. In the first part of the conversation, we found out about his life and what he brings to the role that he has taken up at this bank that has been a great partner of Springboard over the years. And for just those who love taking notes and who may, who may have just joined us, the lessons from me among gratitude so far. Number one, he's a product of great leadership and great followership. Number two, everywhere he's worked, he doesn't see it as a bad place or a bad experience because there's something that he learns and something that he benefits wherever he goes. He sees the purpose that serves in his life. Number three, he talks about learning from followers, and that part really fascinates me. The fact that he mentioned a list of people that he had been with, Peter, Farian, Charles, Bridget, Margaret, Jeff, and the lessons from each person, and, he, and a number of them that he could even trace their names, but what was significant for me is the lessons from these followers, especially the one who took him into the Tell her enclosure for four hours and taught him about patience and routine. And that is my lesson three. Lesson four is about calmness. And he says when the heat is highest, that is when he's calmest because the firm or industry gets signals 
from the leader. When you panic, it could be costly. Lesson five is about being impact-focused and not title-focused. He says that as a person, he's not a title person, he's an impact person. His thoughts about what impact can I make? What opportunities are there to learn and to grow? And that is what drives every career decision he makes. And of course, who will he be working with? Because the person and the trust for the person is very key. And that is how come he was able to make a transition from being CEO or managing director at Bayport to become executive director at the UMB Bank. He says connection is point number six. When people feel connected to you in their hearts, their hands will sacrifice and do beyond what you expect from them. Number seven is about failure. That £7,000 mistake, signing up to a course, not completing it with the excuse of time, and interestingly, spending the same time at a busier role to do a similar course. I'm telling you, I'm sure that is your favorite <laughs> lesson so far because of the money involved. But that's the cost of learning these lessons. You are spending your one hour to learn a £7,000 lesson here on Springboard, your virtual university. Ni, thank you for those, those lessons. Very priceless. Thank you for distilling them. <laughs> Which is your favorite so far? Um... So I think I always go back to the one about uh, the, the opportunity cost of not doing something that needs to get done, hmm. which is the one you talked about, the 7,000 mistakes. It's a, it's a cost. <laughs> and the fact that your wife must have given you a warning. And, and this was 2002, therefore, so you can wow. imagine it was very painful. <laughs> I can imagine that. But, but for me, um, I'm always saying, I don't know how much more time I have from here. Um, what, anything could happen. Um, and so if there's something to do now, let's Finish it. Let's just do it and be done with it. Let's talk about it now. So you walk into UMD Bank as Executive Director of Business with 20 years of experience from various banking roles. Let's talk about banking. How much has banking changed? And why do I say, let's, why do I say to bank or not to bank? Recently, I, I, I had a conversation with my good friend, Madame Esther Koba. I mean, she's a guru in communications. And she was talking about about the simplicity of communication. And she says a town crier in her childhood went into the neighborhood beating a gong gong and telling the people to take their money to the bank. And the gong gong beater said, if you don't take your money to the bank, rodents will chew the money under your bed. Mm. And she was using that to teach us the simplicity of communication. So sitting with you today, when I said, let's talk about to bank or not to bank, I'm saying, all right, so for the people <coughs> listening out there, you are a banker, that means you sell banking products. As Takoba says, years ago, they took a gong to town to tell people, don't keep your money under your bed, take it to the bank. You are a banker. <laughs> to bank or not to bank, why must we bank? I'm, I'm having a real difficulty trying to meet that extent reason. <laughs> Give it a shot. It's, it's, so, it's, it's so authentic. And... and, 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 and the, 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 the rat might not be your fiscal rat today, um, but um, the extent to which a people bank actually helps the economy grow. Help us Everywhere understand. where you've, you've got a alternative economy where it's not reflected out there in banking and all of that one, you always notice those countries when, when there's a real downturn, nobody understands what's really happening. Um, and and, and, and for, us, for many people, banking is a very um, personal, individualized experience. But actually, that's how a society makes decisions about where to invest. It's where it funds new ideas that makes their society grow. It is not perfect. And typically, when bankers talk about why banking is important, it always sounds very shallow. And I, I totally appreciate that because we've been involved in some of the worst crimes in history. But take every single major economic meltdown that happens that actually started with the, with the banks or with the bank. And you'll be hard-pressed to find that society not returning to the same framework. It's because society has not yet created a process that allows it to con make considerations around where do we store our wealth? How do we give those who have got great ideas but no um, capital 
the opportunity to do that. Um, if I had all these ideas and I wanted to bring them to bed, where do I go? Um, society has still not figured out a better way. Increasingly, there are iterations that are being made and you can see various aspects of banking actually leave traditional banking. But even with the new banking experiences we are having, they are still making the same um, decisions, making the same considerations that banking does. So maybe, maybe it may not be banks in the future that may be making those decisions, but the function of making the considerations about where we invest to create, where, how do we fund new solutions in our society? How do we store wealth? How do we distribute wealth? Will always be required in our society. And, and so when you don't, when you keep your money under your bed, um, you, you actually, it, it, it's very unsocial. <laughs> Antisocial in the sense that it, 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 you, you take away from the transparency of understanding how the economy works. Um, I'm going to come to you with, with very tough, very tough questions about uh, issues that people have put on social yes, media because yes. in the build up to this very powerful interview we put a hashtag out on our social media pages mm -hmm. to bank or not to bank and ask people to share their great experience with the bank and their bad experience with the bank and you're speaking for your whole industry <laughs> as you sit here so the, the 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 challenge for people is that you talk about a place for storage and distribution of wealth. And the first, the first contribution is from Pastor Albert Otin in Takrade, who says, I went to my bank to collect my own money, and it is a problem. So the issue of storage and distribution, uh, his first comment on social media was, hmm. I mean, I asked, share your good experience and bad experience. He says, hmm. hmm. Then I say, also for <laughs> details, he says, ah, but why, why is it that I go to the bank to collect my own money and I can't get it? So before we even go into um, the, the future of banking, what is the trust level like between people and the banks? And how can we bridge that if there are issues? I mean, that's, that's actually one of the biggest challenges uh, with banking today. And unfortunately, in many spheres of life, in many parts of the world, it's not just here in Ghana or in West Africa or in Africa, but across the world, trust in banking is extremely low. Why? Because, because of the behaviors that so many who have had the privilege of occupying those decision-making points within the banking sector have failed to do right. Um, and, and, I mean... Because of that, I mean, if you've gone through the experiences where you've actually lost your money or you've gone through experiences where you've been cheated or you've gone through experiences where one or two or a few, a few men at the table have stolen your pensions or your savings or, or indulged in some venture that's totally lost you your, your life savings, you, it's, it's impossible for you to have any trust for that um, scenario, and which is why I said, Whilst it's not perfect, it's how society has dealt with it. How, how do we bridge that? Um, and, and increasingly, you are be, we, are, we are beginning to see, even in the regulation that is coming through in banking, an inflection point on things like climate change, on things like um, green earth, on things like uh, ethical behavior. Um, and, and, and some of the uh, big framework for governance these days spell out clear codes of conduct and behavior for bankers. And the laws are increasingly getting stranger. Gone were the days when you could be a board member for a bank that actually um, broke something and then you got away with it. Today, there are prison terms. As you sign on to the job, you are introduced to the possible prison terms you'll be facing if you are the director of a board. So your job there is to be, uh, you've got this fiduciary responsibility to make sure that things actually go right. So um, a lot of the mystery that shrouded banking is being taken off. Um, a lot more players who are more altruistic are being allowed to enter that space. Um, banking is, a, is, a, is an infinitely more difficult job 
today than it ever has been um, in, in, in the history of banking. That said, we still have a long way to go to create the kind of respect and trust that makes banking a lot more than it is today. Um, that, 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 that's always going to be an ongoing debate. You've mentioned what the regulator brings to bear, and I can relate to the fact that you're seeing that there's such strong regulation today compared to yes. the past. And in that regard, even taking up responsibility in an organization goes through intense scrutiny, scrutiny. just so that you do not Absolutely. take it lightly. Absolutely. That will be the contribution of the regulator. Yes. What is the contribution of the banks yourselves to increasing the people's trust in you? Let's talk to the person out there who runs a barbering shop, the person who runs a cold store business, the person who runs a school. You are telling them, bring your school fees, let them pay school fees through the bank, let them do this through the bank. How, what encouragement do you have for that person out there who says, oh yeah, regulator, yes, but you yourselves, what do you, bring, what do you bring to the table? No, Reverend, you're absolutely spot on. And, and you will see that there's been a, a, a new breed of leaders who are coming out who are saying, yes, these things are true about us, but we want to change that persona that we have. Um, and so you, you see the banks who, on the back of all the things that happened after George Floyd and, and the Black Lives Matter, come out with new terms of engagement with their communities in which they work. Um, and in and in-house, in every bank today, there is there are stronger guidelines and rules that have to do with how do you engage a customer. Um, there, are, there, are, there are banks in Ghana today who will suck you on the spot for bad engagement with your customer. Um, while, whilst that, that, that immediately shows you how seriously they take their customer, um, I think that there's also, it, it speaks a lot about how things have changed. When it used to be the banker's market where, you know, you could go and queue. I remember those days where I could go to um, a bank and I'd actually take a storybook with me because I knew I would be there for at least four hours. So I have my little book, which has got all my things and I'll keep it here <laughs> and then I'll carry my book and I'll go and sit and read. That spoke to your expectation. Were you, were you in banking then? No, I wasn't. But I knew. It was, it was so normal. Today, if any bank tries that, you close by the day, by the time business closes. You cannot do that. This is the age when people take videos of what's ex happening to them as they experience it. This is the day where reportage is not waiting for the late news. It's happening <laughs> as, as it goes on. So there's a lot more scrutiny. There's a lot more monitoring. There's a lot more... Um, um, intelligence about banking. Um, the, 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 the courts are also doing their job and making sure that quite a lot of people are being brought back on track because they have not done, they have not taken their duty of care seriously. So banking is, 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 is changing very quickly. And as a community, we can actually insist on getting the right kind of service that is, is, is deserved by us as, as people who, who bank. Um, for, 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 for me in the leadership of a bank, it's, and, and I, I, I know I speak for many other leaders, we want the trust. We know what could happen if we had the trust. We know how we could work better if we had the trust. But there's so much we need to also do. We also need to take off that shroud of secrecy and mystery about banking. How transparent are you? When a customer comes to engage you, can he have a, a clear understanding of how long this will, will take to happen? And when you fail, would you come back and say, I failed in getting this done at the time that you told me to do it? Um, we will do it at this time. We will reward you for taking your value. You know, we are going to have to, and I think it's getting there, where we are talking about things like service guarantees, where people are beginning to you know, take on banks and say, no, I'm not going to take this from you. I like the point about service guarantees. Let me, let me trace the meaning of service guarantee and ask you, a question relating to that. A service guarantee is a marketing tool used to reduce customer risk perceptions, signal quality, and differentiate a service offering. So you're looking at reducing the perception of risk, signal quality, and differentiate your service offering. How can technology enable this 
guarantee process. I mean, banking has become big on technology. Today we're talking about branchless banking, <laughs> all kinds of things. How, how real is this evolution of the industry and how can technology guarantee the quality that you talk about? Actually, I, I, for me, I think it's like technology that actually makes this possible. Um, because this is the kind of um, offering or assurance that requires real-time reporting, that requires real-time tracking, monitoring, uh, making sure that um, as the service is being delivered, it is totally covered, um, so that at the end of the day, you're able to make um, decisions or considerations as to where service fell through the cracks, um, where it was delivered as it was expected, and all of that. And so it's technology that does that. Um, if you have this process where you are able to mirror and capture the entire process um, on a platform so that you can track the response time, how long did it take for you to deliver this part? What were the, what were the handoff times to the next department? Um, did you have the full support from the customer documentation, all of that one? All of those things allow the, the customer to appreciate what's happening internally. But then before a company or a firm offers you a service guarantee, it means they've done their work. Because this, you could easily lose a lot of money because as you're rewarding, you're also losing. And that's what, that's what and it costs both sides right. something for the process to fail. To be fair to you, I, I, I earlier mentioned that this week we've had quite a number of people posting both good and bad experiences. And if we tried to go into all of them, it would have, it would have taken the conversation <laughs> in a different direction. But I think we've captured in a nutshell the concerns that customers have, the issues of trust. Yeah. You're talking about service guarantees. You're talking about measurement. You're talking about being, being humble enough to admit that in some cases you didn't get it right. Something that I think will resonate with many of our customers. But I want to explore technology a bit more. You're saying that technology is the enabler of the service guarantees that mm. you promise. And you are promising because mm. you've done your homework. Mm. But for the person out there who is not really a proponent of technology, mm. help them to know, based on the mandate of banking, mm. how much technology has made the life of the customer of a bank easier. And you can use so, real life UMB examples if you want to, but just to get, help sure, get a sense. Sure, sure. So um, you remember I told you how I would go to a bank and, and this was some 30 um, something years ago. Um, it was a big bank, a big hall, but myself with all the other workers and everybody, when you came, you knew you would not leave it's there. A, it's a camp meeting. It was a camp I mean, <laughs> We all came, there were queues going out of the hall. Everybody was unhappy, but no one complained. It was kind of like, this is what banking was to us. Today, and in fact, as early as 20, 2009, 2010, when the ATMs, long after the ATMs had become the staple, you know with ATMs, almost 90% of all banking all transactions disappeared. So from that time till now, we're actually just struggling over the 10% of the transactions left in the hall. And even with that, with digital banking, uh, where banks have got their apps, where there are so many other payment portals, much of that is gone again. So you've, you've actually got banks who did not move quickly, who actually lost their customers. And the banks move quickly to actually um, put in place those digital um, tools. So, so for many people, if you start asking the, um, our five, six million bank population, how do they do banking traditionally? The banking hall is not the place people go to anymore. Banking halls are actually get emptying out. More and more people actually transact from the comfort of their homes on the go. And at business, they, they don't need to walk into a bank, you know. And with these developments, would you say that your bank in particular has any advantage so, so in this particular competitive Absolutely. Matrix? So we have, we have a tool, we have a, a product called the Speed App, um, which helps us do the transfers. So if you want to do payments from your wallet, your Momo wallet to the bank, out of the bank, you want to pay monies to another account in another bank, across accounts within the same bank, um, you want to... Um, stop a check, you want to um, send a message to your bank about how to deal with your ATM card, you feel maybe it is at risk. These are things that are no longer even, they're not even transactions to work into a you know, bank. You know, you know I'm complaining about this. 
you know, you know the, the, the traditional mind says, Charlie, money, there must be some small <laughs> control before. <laughs> when, it, when it's so accessible, when you say, yeah, we'll be scanning you now. Right? <laughs> but on a, on, a, on a more serious note, the level of, the level of convenience you des describe is something I can testify to. I recall going to watch a football match several years ago, and a couple of years ago, and then sitting somewhere in Manchester after the football match, realizing that, okay, I have to pay my electric electricity bill, water bill, um, DSTV. And just from the comfort of my phone, yeah. just sitting by some water feature, we just yeah. speed up all of it. And exactly. I was like, really? And this the, thing the world has years. changed. Yes. What, and let's come back to you yes. and to your presence in the bank. Whenever an executive is appointed, I ask myself a big question. What do you bring to this bank that seeks to make an impact in a very competitive framework? What does Ni Amankratete bring to UMB? What should we call success if we evaluate your appointment five years from now? What, what, would, what, what should we call success? I know it's a tough question, but I want to put you on the spot. <laughs> so, um, success definitely um, the needs of my employers and stake shareholders and stakeholders, which are the other people in the community, should be met. Um, I expect UMB to grow and all of that. And I, I, I don't take it lightly. I think those are the traffic signals of success. But for me, real success would have been how many people have grown as a result of my leadership. Um, I, I, it, it matters to me um, how many people would have had a different perspective on how to lead. How many people would see UMB as a place where they can commit their energies. Um, and for me, when I leave a place, I... I, I hate it when someone says, oh, things aren't working. It means I did a bad job. Actually, it's an indictment on, on, my, on, my, um, on my leadership. So I hope and pray that when I leave, um, whoever comes in and sits in that chair after me is on this you know, hyper loop of progress and transformation for, for UMB, um, is, is beginning to see all the hard work being done so that you can just have these quantum leaps in, 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 in delivering what we want as, a, as an entity and our contribution to the, to, the, to the society. So for me, it's the various relationships within the bank. Those are the things I look at. But those things mean very little if we did not achieve anything anyone can look at and say, yes, um, things actually changed in measurable ways. Just for the record, when we're talking about um, impact, and measuring your success, you said, I hope and pray. So I paused when you said and pray. Are you a person of great faith? Are you, are you a person of faith? <laughs> I'm a person of faith. Um, it, um, I, I can't begin to explain how I would have dealt with a lot of the many crises in my life without it. Yes, I believe totally in God, in Jesus Christ. I take him very seriously. Take your faith very seriously. Do you take his faith into the marketplace? Yes, um, but for me, I, I don't think it's about me announcing it. If we've done business before, or you have worked with me, and you don't see it, then it means I've got a lot of work to do. Yes, I don't, I don't believe it should be something I announce. Um, I never tell people, oh, I'm, I've, I rarely do that. I don't see it as professional. Um, but people, when they've interacted with you, or had a bad scrap. Many, many years ago, um, one, of my, one of my followers was bad-mouthing me at a session. And unfortunately for him, I happened to be in a room where no one knew I was and we were discussing what he said. So, wow. <laughs> so I think a few days later, some people discussed, uh, were saying, oh, some German was sitting here when we were talking. Oh. And I, somehow he figured out that I heard it. She was in a very bad place. <laughs> you know? And we met up and... I, I said, I mean, that's how I felt about your leadership. Boy, he's, he's, he's entitled to his view. So I said, okay, well, look, uh, look, you can forget about that. I'm hoping that uh, when we've done a few more years, you think of me more kindly, you know, and for him, it was a big deal. Right. Um, Let me take you, um, the last point from you before I tell you what, I, what my learnings are today. In 30 seconds, somebody is starting out on their career, they're confused, they have issues, or somebody stumbled, they tried to climb to where you are today, and they stumbled along the line, or they lost their job a couple of years ago in the banking crisis, and they still haven't found a new job. Somebody's saying, Charlie, you, it's good for you, but 
I am in a tough place. What would be your message of encouragement to somebody who says, Me, you are blessed. I am not so fortunate. What would be your message of encouragement to them? Don't give up. Um, and I, 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 I think, I, I think it's easy. It probably looks easy for me to say it sitting where I'm sitting now, and I agree. Um, but um, long before I got here, I also struggled um, looking for jobs. I pounded the streets in Accra with more than 70 CVs in a folder with my girlfriend, who's not my wife. But we went dropping CVs everywhere and did a reconciliation of how we didn't get it. Um, stayed in a position that I was very unhappy with for a long time. And I, I'll just share with you um, what I call my wilderness experience with that one. I was in a job I was unhappy at, um, bypassed consistently on promotion. I was very, very angry. One of these evenings, late in the night, as I was considering what I was, I, um, it was very clear to me. I told myself that I'm going to come back tomorrow morning and do my best work so that everybody's angry that I'm still here. <laughs> and, and that's exactly what I did. Um, it doesn't mean that you don't cry, you don't feel the pain, you don't argue, you don't shake your fist at God sometimes. Um, but when you've done all of that, your choice is not to give up. It's, giving up is not a choice. You stay on track and you continue at it. Cry when you have to. But look for opportunities all around you. Um, sometimes there are opportunities that we don't like, but which offer us the bridge to what we want. And you, 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 grab all, you grab them with both hands. Um, so I agree, not easy, but you don't give up. Giving up is not it. And resilience will typically carry you through those bad patches until you get to the point where you need to be. Resilience will carry you through those bad patches till you get to the point where you want to be. These are the thoughts of Ni Amankra Tete, Executive Director of Business at UMB Bank Ghana, who has been my guest for the past hour looking at emerging trends in banking and also unpacking the story of his own life and career and what he brings to the bank with his appointment. Lessons for today, and for those of you who are regular proponents, let's have this debate on social media. Which of them is the toughest? These 10 lessons. One is about leadership and followership. He says, I'm a product of incredible leadership, intended and unintended, and amazing followership, and I've worked with some really incredible people. Number two is about positivity. He says, I struggle to see a bad experience in any place where I've worked. Something he just alluded to, and he says, every workplace served a good purpose in my life. Number three, learning from followers. He lists a number of followers who taught him something, including somebody pulling him into the, into the teller enclosure for four hours, and he learning about patience and routine. Number four is calmness, being calm in the midst of the hottest crisis, something he learns by observing other leaders. He says, Firms take their signals from leaders, and when you panic, the whole firm can struggle. Five is about being impact-focused and not title-focused. And he says the measure of what he does or wherever he's going is how much impact he can bring to the place and how much he can learn and contribute as a result of being there. And of course, that's how he managed to transition from being CEO at Bayport to Executive Director at UMB Bank Ghana. The sixth point points about connection. When people feel connected to you at heart, they will give their all for you. Number seven is about failures. He talks about that interesting seven thousand pound. Was it an investment? I, I hesitate to say money. Money flashed down the drain, but let's call it an investment because it taught you a lesson. But the seven thousand pounds dumped into an MBA program he didn't finish because he said he was too busy and yet later at, a, at an even busier role he invested the same, uh, same, in the same program and completed it a lesson about time management number eight is about trust humbling point many are skeptical about, about the banking industry because of past experiences and he says the industry must be humble enough to admit that there were times they didn't get it right and stretch out to the customers, reach out to them, and regain their trust by bending over, which is something that they are working very hard on. And he says, it is backed also by strong regulation where any director knows before you take the position that you are in for something and you can't take it for granted. And he says, those are changes that are very positive. Number nine is about a consumer's market and not a banker's market, where banks have put in place real-time measures of service quality and can even fire you 
for going outside the approved measure just to make sure the customer is happy. And number 10, he says, this level of service guarantee and quality is powered by technology, making possible for consumers something that 10 years ago, 20 years ago was thought to be impossible. And that's the conversation we've had with Ni Amankra Tete. Which one is your favorite? Let's have the conversation on social media. Ni, thanks so much for coming Thank to you, the Virtual University. Thank you. Warm regards to the entire crew. <laughs> now I've been in the whole crew at, no at UMB Bank. No Extend our position to them for being great friends of Springboard. No right. No so on behalf of Team Springboard, led by Comfort, my name is Albert Okransi, and a big thank you to MTN Pulse, UMB Bank, the Enterprise Group, the Multimedia Group, the Graphic Business. And on Tuesday, page 18, Niamh Ankara smiling, telling you about emerging trends in banking, including the Bushia Bushia. <laughs> you will love it. Yeah, we will spell it, Bushia Bushia. You will love it. And then you find it also on My Joy Online and then Graphic Online. And that has been a program on emerging trends. God bless you. God bless you, and God bless you.